Okay, so what we will talk today about is Yesot. Yesot is a, yeah, uh, is a Haskell web framework. Uh, there are multiple web frameworks, but this one is one of the most widely used and probably the, the most comprehensive. Um, you can find all the documentation online. There is a book uh, and a cookbook uh, which are available. Uh, and you can learn, you need to allocate a little bit of time learning it. Uh, so I cannot teach you, you know, the framework in, in, a, in a single lecture, but what we can do is I can show you some code, which is using that framework to get you a feel of what, um, of what it looks like. So there, there are two examples. So one example is in our repo. Uh, it's called student web. Another example I will show you now. Um, to get started, uh, if you go to, uh, I think if you go to Haskell resources, uh, you will see that there is, um, no. So if you go to Yesod actually, if you go to Yesod, you will have um, a stack templates. So if you go to stack templates, you will see that there are some templates for Yesod that you can uh, do with your own setup. So let me see. Let's get rid of that. So if you say stack new, no, yeah, stack. Uh, and then you, you say whatever project you want. So like, you know, my web project, whatever it is. And then you can say uh, one of those uh, templates. So for example, if you say simple, uh, it will kind of generate the code for you with no um, database at all. And then the, the minimal is, really small uh, backbone scaffold. And then you have kind of a four database options that it will generate kind of a skeleton for you, right? So what I've done is I've done the simple thing and the simple thing is already in the repo and it's called status. Um, it's called fellow web. So the hello web example is the scaffold, which is the simple, is this one. Uh, and we, we will talk a little bit about it in a moment. Uh, and then students web is, uh, is the minimal scaffold, which doesn't have any fancy, um, like it's, it's a really, like you can compare this one with this one. So this one doesn't have sort of the main application structure. I kind of put it myself. And it doesn't have any bootstrap or any formatting. Uh, it's just bare bone HTML and so on. Whereas this one is already quite nice. It uses it uses bootstrap and it kind of generates the skeleton for your web app. Whereas this one is not. It's only use it's using yes but without the skeleton. I will I will show you in a moment. Um, so what I wanted to start with is. Um, let's go back to lectures. So if you want to get a feel of how it would be uh, to program in ESOT, uh, this is kind of a good example. So it's not, um, it's kind of in the middle. It, it has uh, some, some things which are kind of from the minimal template, but it, it uses uh, some, um, some structure for the, for the program. So everything is kind of in main. So if you go to main, that's where all the magic happens. And you will see usually quite a large number of uh, language extensions that are used with Yesot. Then you will have kind of a number of um, imports that you need for your application, obviously. Um, you notice that often we have name collisions, which means we have to distinguish between certain operations 
done on one uh, data module compared to the other because for example you know everybody uses length as the method for calculating length of some some lists right so the length for the lazy byte string is different than the length for the data text and it's different from the prelude right so you have a collision on length and then you have to kind of distinguish it so then you will can prefix if you mean length from here you say bs dot length and then it will be from here if you say t dot length it will be from here and then if you say prelude dot length or just length it will be from prelude um and then you will have uh yes being kind of the main import and it hides all the additional imports that need to happen so this one kind of a shadows a lot of imports and sometimes you have to expose them sometimes you don't and then you do need your own uh data structure like your own application type and usually you keep here the state so we will see it in a student web that this application has kind of a here we have just an empty data constructor it doesn't hold anything uh, because it's a rest uh, rest example right so what's what's rest what rest stands for yeah and uh it usually means that the state is transferred uh from call to call and you don't have any persistent uh, uh state across the calls right so what it means is if i have a client and i'm doing one call from one client and another call from another client they are completely pure in a sense that i should not have uh leakage of the state from this one to this one somehow right um so that that's why i kind of don't have any state here because the state does need does not need to be inside the application it's sort of uh stored in the back end and then stored on the client right so uh i don't have anything here and that also means that in this type of application i can uh replicate the server multiple times and i don't need to care about um consistency because the consistency is uh you know um supported by the model itself right okay so then you have a, a generator method which uh generates kind of a routing table so that's what we do with golang for us uh, you know uh, subscribing all the routes uh and we do that here as well and we have a little bit of a, uh, we have a little bit of a magic happening. So one because this this method, this um, function, uh, is a generator function which will generate code, uh, which will be subsequently used in the app. So it generates a lot of code for um, our app, and it needs this text, which is exactly the same as the type uh, as the data type of our application, right? So this and this need, need to be the same. And then it has this parse root. You will see that a lot. So you see the open square bracket, sort of like a, a function name, uh, a bar, a bar and the closing square bracket, right? What are the square brackets for in, in Haskell? Lists, exactly. So this is some sort of a magic which will generate a list uh it's you can think of it as sort of like a um, list comprehension <laughs> so it generates a list via this kind of a combinator right so that there is a, a a special way of generating that list and this is the sort of like a quoted argument for this function how this list needs to be generated and this quoted a string so is you know our routes uh, and then as you see we are saying we need text from the T module and we define T as qualified data text, right? And then you have some types. So this is a type that will be our handler for this particular route, right? So for the just a home, um, home screen, we have the home R. Uh, and then here you declare what operations can happen on this type, right? Uh, and the the programmer declared that you can only do get on on the on the empty empty route, and then on the feedback we can do get and post, 
and then on the feedback together with the uh, parameter uh, and the parameter is some text uh, so here you don't define like in other programming languages you declare a variable that will be substituted by the parameter which is passed in the url right here this is not a declaration of the variable here is a declaration what type it will be coerced into right normally what we use we, we use numbers or we use text if, like in this case it's like a longish uh let me just double this duplicate this so i will show you what the um feedbacks looks like so the feedbacks are sort of this type of unique identifiers right and you can pass it in the url and that will be coerced into text right um there is a there is a debate going on uh, in Haskell community because historically we've been using string for everything and string is quite nice because it's a, a, a very intuitive way of representing strings as a list of cars right, but it turns out it's a little bit inefficient if you really represent it as a list of cars it's better to represent it as sort of a blob that you can do stuff with say as same as with other programming languages. So then we have data text, which does that. So data text is basically a string with the underlying implementation that is much more efficient. Uh, and it you know, duplicates all the length and concatenates and so on methods such that you can have like a list feel of a text, but normally you don't use text as a list, you use text as text. Um, so there is a debate of converting a lot of standard libraries instead of using string to using text and text becoming the new de facto string type for, for Haskell. So in your own APIs, you may struggle a little bit with conversions between the packed strings as text and, and back and forth. And that, that's what my problem was. Um, I will tell you later uh, about. So this is the type. Uh, so, so this is the type and that signifies okay there would be a parameter of that type you can you can have multiple parameters you can say slash and another parameter right so you can construct the the routes um, the way you want um, those are keywords so they will generate um, kind of a routing into different delete get and put right and then you need this uh, which makes your app which makes your data type an instance of yes of, of the web framework. Um, and that is pretty much all boilerplate that you need to do. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> this and this is the boilerplate because this you have to have somehow, you have to declare the routes. Um, and then once you declare all the routes and you declare your types, then for every uh, rest method, you need a function which will be kind of uh, dealing with this with this route. Uh, and you do that by repeating this name and prefixing it with get, post, put, or delete in front. So that's the kind of the convention of how you do it. Uh, that, that R here is not needed actually, uh, but by convention, everybody is using R to signify that this is a route type, that it's a type used for routing. Uh, because it's not an, the normal usual data type that you deal like app, but it's a special type for doing the routes. You can just call it home, but then it will not be distinguished uh, with, with prep, uh, post fixing it with R, you will kind of make it um, that different. So then there are a couple of uh, functions. So you have get feedback uh, for feedback R get, you need post feedback as well. Yes, we have post feedback. Uh, then we have uh, get feedback by our by ID, right? So we have get, put, and delete. So we need get feedback by ID, put feedback by ID, and delete feedback by ID. And then we need one more, which is the get home, right? So the get home is the last one, and the get home is the simplest. And here you say it is a handler, right? Same as Golang. You say, okay, I have to have kind of a callback for this handler, which will the which will my web framework will route the route to. Um, and then you specify what it produces, right? And in our case, it produces a string. 
right? And this is what it produces, this welcome to feedback on anything. And it says, send the status as JSON, send, you know, okay, uh, error code and send this string back, right? So if you want to send something back, you know, this is as a string, this is how you do that. If you need to send, you see that here as well. Um, and all those will be sent as strings, uh, which is um, the, the type which the handler kind of um, returns. So it takes um, like the delete feedback by uh, ID takes a text as a parameter and produces the handler, right? And this parameter is here. So then we can do something with, with our parameter. And in, in our case, uh, what we do is um, we, um, we obtain the path by concatenating this feedback as, as you see here. So if I have my top level and top level folder, and then there is a feedback, and then there will be this kind of a long text as a identifier. So we say feedback concatenated with this. So X is a string, so we need to unpack it. Uh, X is a text, so we need to unpack it to a string, and then we can concatenate it with this string and with this string. So we basically converting it into a kind of a JSON path. Uh, and then we say, remove that path. And then we say, the, okay, uh, the, the file was removed, right? So you can sort of read this code, even if you don't really fully understand all those methods, they are quite descriptive. Uh, and you sort of see what's, what's going on. So we basically have a simple REST API that we can get and post feedbacks in. And then uh, like, uh, in, like here by get, we will get all the feedbacks. By post, we will create a new feedback. By get, we get a concrete feedback. By put, we can modify the concrete feedback and then we can delete a concrete feedback, right? So let's see how the get gets all the feedbacks. So it will be get feedback R. So get feedback R is this one. And what we do is we get the content of the directory. So we get all the names of the files which we have in, this, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the feedback directory. And then we kind of uh, iterate over all those files and prepare the, the response that will be sent as a, as a JSON with the OK 200. Uh, and the feedback is um, kind of obtained from this computation here, right? So we reading the files and we kind of uh, decoding, decoding the files to obtain uh, the feedbacks. And the feedbacks are JSON structs. So, you know, they have some structure, right? The, the model is described in the, in the other folder. Uh, and then you kind of get it back. So, and, and the handling is kind of really trivial. And as you see, the responses are not HTML. All the responses are either JSON, uh, actually are always JSON, but it's either structured JSON with the curly braces or just a string, right? So you know in JSON you have uh, certain data types and one of the data types is a string. And if you just send a string without any curly braces, that's a legal JSON as well, right? Um, so they, they like the, the developers are, are doing that. In this case, we're sending the structured uh, L array because it will be a list. So it will be a turned into array of those JSON structures, structures right? Uh, this code may look a little bit complex, but you know uh, it's it's not really that complex. Uh, Lift IO means we are doing something here which involves IO, which is like you know we're reading files, we're reading files from a file system. So we need to have access to IO. And currently we are inside a Yesod monad, so it like some monadic contexts are composed uh, from. Uh, kind of a tower of different monadic contexts, right? So you have the inner inner layer, which is kind of your innermost monad. And then this monad can live in the outer monad. 
and then this can live in the other one and so on. So you have kind of like a power of monads and then lift IO means no matter in which context you are, you can always sort of do calls from the innermost IO monad such that you do some IO out of it. Usually the IO is sort of the uh, innermost. So, or, or rather outermost. And you kind of lifting your context to that IO context such that you can do IO. So lift IO basically says, inside here, we're doing something that involves IO. And then you are basically folding using that function. Uh, so fold is like fold, um, but it's on a monadic context. So instead of doing fold R or fold L on the list, you're doing something on kind of a monadic context and you start with an empty list and then you filter, uh, you know, a certain, uh, uh, you have a certain um, check and then you're doing this function. So what all this function is doing is like reading files, decoding them uh, and then putting them into this list. And that will be a list of those contents of those files. And then that list will be turned into a, into a, a JSON by this send JSON call. So as you can see, it, it is quite complex, but it's not, there is nothing really magical happening. Uh, and the same as here, uh, again, we kind of reading. So let's say we reading uh, a feedback by particular ID. So what we need to do, we need to read that file. We have to construct the path to that file. We need to read the content of the file and then we decode the content into a JSON, right? Because it will be a string with the curly braces and all that, like all the things that I showed you here. Um, so it's, it is JSON. So then decoding this into JSON, this string into JSON will be done by the decode content. And then you are decoding it into a feedback um, type. And the feedback type is declared in, inside the, Oh, oops, sorry, uh, wrong, wrong button um, here. It's inside the model. So in models, you have a declaration of the feedback type and it basically has an ID and the dirty feedback. And then the dirty feedback is target with some unique IDs and then experience and the comment with the text. Um, and then, you know, it has, a spe you know, the instances we already know to JSON and from JSON. Uh, so how to get this structure from and to JSON and, and so on. So there is a little bit of, uh, uh, there are a little bit of uh, different methods. So you can get, you can convert a dirty feedback into a clean feedback by uh, saving it into the, uh, into the backstore uh, and also doing some uh, sanitation on the on the data, right? So this code is uh, the link is in the in the lecture, and you can kind of uh, do a little bit of reading. Uh, and if you have any specific questions of something being unclear, then we can talk about it. Um, and it's a good demonstration of what would be needed for a simple REST service written in Yesod and written in Haskell uh, with some of those functions that you kind of get, can get from here, right? So this is kind of a good cookbook of how you're sending responses and where, where you can find those things. So, you know, if you want to send uh, 400, you, you have it here. Uh, and those are declared in network HTTP types, right? So you can also browse those through Google to see what, you know, what is where. Um, and then unique identifiers you get from data uh, UUID. So for a simple REST API where you're not generating any HTML, this to me feels quite simple. And also this to me feels quite similar to how you would wire things up in Golang, right? Uh, you have to register your handlers, you have to prepare the response, and then you need to send the responses out of the handlers. Uh, it's exactly the same. Uh, and unlike Golang, where the handler has a very specific uh, signature, uh, here you kind of have a slightly different signature depending whether you're taking parameters or not. 
right? And then those parameters are kind of passed into your into your functions. Uh, and those parameters will be coerced to that type that you defined. So for example, if it is a UUID, then you represent it as text. Um, if it is, I mean, you could represent it as a string actually. And then if you represent it as a string, you, you would not need to do this uh, pack because X would be a string that automatically, right? But it would be a little bit less efficient. Uh, here you are representing it as a as a text, uh, and you do need to. Uh, unfortunately, you do need to convert it to a string because this uh, this call writing a file expects this to be a string, right? And that's what the debate is to rewrite those things to actually use text. If this thing if this thing here was using a text, then you would use concatenate you would construct a, a new text out of those three texts uh, because you can coerce a string literal to a text by the overloading strings uh, and then you could construct this as a text and that would be much more efficient right uh, so it will happen but we're just waiting like when uh, those things are kind of a breaking changes because they break all the API like this becoming a text oh sorry this becoming a text sort of breaks everybody using it as a string, right? Um, all right, so this is uh, a first cookbook, uh, which you have in the, uh, in the lecture. Um, um, yeah, it, it's here. And then the second one is in the, uh, in the repository. So cool. I just double check that I have everything and then It's called Student Web. And to browse it, yeah, it's, it's good to use the IDE. Uh, it's a little bit uh, complicated. And then having an IDE and being able to hover over the, the types kind of helps. So let me, let me move it here. So what is this one? Uh, this one is, Okay, so while it's doing its magic, I will show you what it is. So I will say stack test. There are some doc tests, not, not many. I, I, I am guilty of not doing a lot of testing with this yet. Uh, I will write some, uh, some route tests uh, to show you how would you test your routes. Um, and then what it does, um, yeah, unfortunately, on this laptop, it's uh, sluggish. It, 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 it's good to have a little bit faster, uh, faster machine. So while this one is doing, I I will change the fonts. So. All right, so yes, appearance. Yeah, that's not enough. Thank you, maybe. Is that readable? Not really. A bit small. So let's try it one of you. Okay, so it's still doing the, the magic. So unfortunately, I, I, uh, IntelliJ is doing some indexing. So it occupies the CPU and then this guy is compiling and occupies CPU as well. So let's just look at the template. Uh, again, some necessary uh, language extensions. Um, and then my type, the app type, uh, I have it slightly different. So I have it, you know, what's the difference between new type and data type? 
uh, I don't want to go into kind of a technical details, but usually if you have a very simple type that doesn't have anything like just have a single constructor and some stuff for the single data constructor, then a new type actually is faster uh, beneath. So it's like implementation wise, uh, using a new type for your type is faster than using a data, but you can use data here and it would work exactly the same uh, with the uh, distinction that uh, the linter would complain that, okay, you just have a very simple type uh, and you have just a single data constructor, then why don't you use data type, right? Uh, uh, new type. So if, um, if I, new type. and then you will notice that I actually have a function which returns IORF to student store, right? So if you go to a lib, uh, you will see that I have the, the student type, uh, which has name, surname, and date of birth. And date of birth is a day type from the calendar. So we're using the uh, data time calendar for representing dates. And I am using text for my name and surname because we're using the web um, you know, text engine. So I don't need to convert it to strings. So instead of using string, I'm using kind of a text. Um, and then you will notice that I have a data store, which is um, uh, again with a single data constructor. So I probably should use a new type here as well. And then it stores a key and a map between integers and students, right? So each student will have an integer ID and that ID is kind of in the map. So the, the ID will be the key and the student will be the value, right? So in my store, I have the student types, which are those. And then the ID of a student is kind of the key to this, to this mapping. So why do I have this one? Uh, this one is the last key that has been generated. So I know what, like how many students have been generated because I keep track of the last key, right? Um, and because I keep track of the last key, I, when I'm creating a new student, I know that's the new key that it's gonna be given to the, to the new student, right? So it's sort of like an auto increment, very naive auto increment on your data structure, such that it always gets the la la last kind of unused key, right? Uh, I could use UUIDs and then I don't need to keep track of that because with UUIDs, they are always unique. But with here, I kind of keep track of the unique key by keeping track of what's the latest unique key. And I start with zero, right? So the empty store basically generates an empty map and generates, it tells me, okay, the next key given to the new student will be, you know, uh, uh, zero, right? Because uh, it will be one because zero is the last unused, is, is the last used key, right? So the next key will be um, zero. Uh, so then I have kind of a um, add student and uh, it takes a student and it takes a student store and it basically inserts uh, with this new key. So because I started with zero, the first key will be one, right? Because I, I'm always doing n plus one. Uh, and then I return this last used key and I, I do this mapping with the, uh, with the student store. And I return the new student store after this operation happens, right? So this operation is a pure function. Uh, it just has sort of like a, a list of, of pairs and this int map, um, the int map is um, like, uh, data and map is basically a, a list of tuples with integer and some sort of value. Um, and in my case, it's this, this value type is a student type, right? So it's like this. And this list of those types has a certain lookup key and insert uh, methods which allow me to manipulate the, uh, the structure. 
Okay, and then I have a delete, which is using, uh, again, the delete, and you, you give what key should be deleted, and then you give the, the student store, and then I create a new student store with this um, uh, N and the new, um, new DB that, that is given here. So there is no, it, it's all pure functions. There is nothing kind of strange happening with the student and with the student store. The strange thing is happening with the, uh, with the fact that my students is not student store, but rather IORF because I need to change that, right? I need to be keep changing what is my new store. Every time I add a student, I have to replace the old state with the new state, right? So if I didn't have this, if I said a uh, student app takes the particular store and initially it's an empty store, uh, that would mean um, I never really mutate that state, right? To be able to mutate that state, I have to have the IO ref. There are different uh, mechanisms for mutating a state, and IO ref is one of them. Um, and if we go to Google, uh, IO ref. So you will see that um, in data IORF, you have um, a type and it takes a parameter like what is being stored. And it has a couple of, of methods, couple of functions. So new IORF basically takes a value and kind of uh, wraps it into the IORF context, right? Um, read from takes the IORF uh, of certain type and gives you an IO of that type. So then you, your value, you see your value changes a monad. Uh, it changes a monad from IORF context to just IO, right? Uh, and then you can write uh, uh, a new value into the IORF context, and then you can modify. So what's the difference between write and modify? Write takes a new value, and replaces the old value with the new value and gives an IO action as a, sorry, and gives an IO action as a return, right? So it doesn't like, um, uh, why, why it returns IO action? So that you can do those operations in the context of IO. So you can lift. So every time you need to do read, write, or modify, you will be doing them in the IO context, right? because that's what is returned. So like whatever context you are in, if you lift to IO, then you can call read, write, or modify, right? And then write takes a, a plain value, plain new value, and replaces it inside here with whatever value was there before. And modify takes a function which mutates your value, right? So if you were to mutate your value, you would use modify, but if you want to replace it with a new value, then you use write. And then to get the value, you would use read. Again, you would lift read IORF to an IO context. It will return you the, the IO A, and then you can use the left arrow to get the A directly, right? And this is what, um, this is what my uh, routes are doing. So I lift reading from the reference to the IO, and I'm using the left arrow to get the, the store in a kind of a pure form without the IO context. And then I can do something with the store, right? So with the store, I, I am kind of a pattern matching for N and the list. And then I get from the list, I get all the, um, the a, a list is all the students, right? So I have the key and the value. And to get all the values, I can get them via this call, right? Um, so then I get all the students and I'm doing some, some magic. So let's briefly talk about this magic. So the, everything else here is very similar to the REST, uh, REST API example. Um, the only difference is that I am in my handlers, I'm not returning value or string, I'm returning HTML. So I need to generate this HTML. So it will become a page, right? 
so just to show you um so the tests there is a failure somewhere uh let's see if it builds so the test should fail um and it kind of failed without really printing me like which test failed so there is probably um something wrong with the new ways i'm i'm, I'm doing things because it seems to be building fine and then if i go to a local host port 3000 uh you will have that app so there is some html which is generated uh we have no students in the database yet and then we can add new students so if i say uh bob marley and then pick uh, pick the date of birth why whatever it is then i have a new student so the the bob is being added and then the bob is listed here and then i can add another student so let's add alice Cooper. again with some date of birth and then it says whoa i have some input validation happening so the alice needs to be capitalized and cooper needs to be capitalized what if i try to do just a well, I have the name needs to be capitalized and the name needs to be short. So I'm doing the same uh, input validations that I've been doing with the previous example for students, uh, hello students, where we were doing the validations. So if I say Alice and if I say uh, Cooper, then I can add a new Alice Cooper there. Uh, and then if I click on that thing, it gets me, you see the URL is student one. It gets me the student, and then if I click on delete, uh, it will delete the, the entry, right? And then I have only Alice there. So I have the ability to add, check, and uh, delete. I don't have the ability to modify. Um, and then those um, those mechanisms, like for uh, creating a new student uh, and for deleting, and forgetting are sort of done here. And the easiest one is the delete, because with the delete, we have sort of like the REST API. Uh, I'm basically obtaining the IO ref into my, um, into my app. I'm doing the lifting to get the score. And then I just pass the, the ID, which I got from the call and the score to the delete student function. Uh, and then I, it will return a new store, a, a new list basically, and I um, write it back into the IO reference, uh, and then I redirect to home. So I'm kind of not doing uh, anything here with the UI. I'm kind of redirecting to home, uh, and I'm doing this um, manipulation of the state in this line. Um, the other calls are a little bit complicated because I have this uh, rendering of the of the layout. So every time I'm returning HTML, I have to generate this HTML. And then I'm generating it by a call to default layout with the parameter being this, again, this generator. Um, uh, and there are a couple of languages that you can use for. Uh, so uh, widget, uh, widget Hamlet is for HTML. Uh, and then Julius is for JavaScript. Uh, and then there is another one, Lucius, for CSS. So the Yesot has kind of like a family of languages for templating. Uh, and then you are doing this kind of escape uh, generation with these bars and then generating kind of like an HTML. Uh, and 
it looks like a HTML, but you don't need to use the ending tags. And then if you have something that is nested, you can do it by indentation, right? So we know that LI is uh, a child of UL. So you do kind of a nesting, same as you do in, uh, in Haskell syntax. And then for routing, you do the ampersand with the type that you want to route into. And for extraction of the variables, you do this notation like a uh, cache with the curly braces and the name of the variable. So the name, the variable comes from here. I have a name, surname, and date of birth. And then I can do certain uh, substitutions with that. Um, so for example, surname is here, and then the age is not like uh, implemented yet. So you may have a task giving a, a D, which is a day to render it here inside the template, right? So please have a look uh, into the repository to check, try to analyze the code, uh, try to modify it, try to add your own things. Um, and this code uh, is more complex to what we were dealing so far, right? Uh, so far we've been dealing with just pure functions. So kind of on that level of the lip. Uh, so start here. Uh, start like what is happening here, how the students are added and retrieved from the store and what the student type is and how it integrates with the calendar, for example. Um, and then go to routes and try to follow how the HTML is generated and uh, how we're dealing with uh, the form. So the uh, static uh, HTML generation is relatively simple, uh, but so here, for example, I'm getting all the students, and then if I get nothing, I say that there was no student like that with this particular ID, and then if I got the student, then I sort of render the student in this uh, particular way, and I add additional G uh, JavaScript when you click on the delete text, right? Okay, so please check it out, uh, bring me questions for the next, uh, next class. And uh, we will continue with, I think we will continue with Rust next, uh, next week on Monday. So thanks for this. I have Christopher already here, you know, kicking me out. So see you on Monday. <laughs>